Good evening, everyone. I hope you're well. Welcome to our uh, webinar on the topic of uh, places, spaces and faces um, and looking at wider community development. So for those of you that have been with us for the last three weeks, welcome back. For those that you're joining this evening, welcome. Um, those of you joining us in the garden, fair play to you all if you're in the garden, hopefully with a, a nice ice cold drink. Um, and if you're, uh, if you're unable to handle the heat and you've joined us indoors, then uh, that's probably a, a very wise move because it's exceptionally warm this evening. But wherever you are this evening, thank you very much for joining us. Um, it's great to have you all on board again. So, who am I? My name is Danielle Warnes. I am the National Club Services Manager here at the Football Association. Um, I do the, the little spiel right at the beginning of the webinars and then I hand over to the experts and clubs and leagues that very rightly um, are more experts in some of these topics than me because they're out there in the field delivering in and around the topics that we discuss. So just a little bit of housekeeping. I do apologise in advance if you have uh, already been on a number of these and I'm sure with our, our new ways of living, you're all on different types of uh, online meeting platforms. But just as a gentle reminder, please do make sure that your cameras are off. Um, they should have automatically been turned off when you are wrong. Um, please do mute yourself if for whatever reason you've come into the uh, webinar this evening unmuted, please do mute yourself. We do ask you that you remain muted. Um, we do use the chat function as a way of interaction. So I know Russ will ask you to find that in due course, but if you want to get ahead of the game, please do so. Pop your questions in there. Uh, and we'll look to answer them at the end just so we can keep the content flowing. Everyone that signed up this evening, um, whether you're here or haven't been able to join us but still want the content, all of that will be emailed before the weekend. And as I've already covered there, if you do have any questions, please do pop them in the chat. Keep yourself muted until the end um, and then we can uh, roll through the content and keep everything flowing. So as I've mentioned um, in passing, uh, this isn't the first webinar we've been hosting. We have hosted a few, as you can see from the nice little honeycomb icon we've got there. So if for whatever reason you haven't been able to catch us on one of the webinars, that's on your screen now, please don't hesitate to email clubsprogram at the fa.com and I'll be able to send you all the relevant recordings, slide deck and case studies that are related to each of those topics. Um, and that applies as well if you haven't caught the first three series of community engagement, I can 100% send them across to you. That's no problem. As like I say, just email the email address on the left hand side. If you want to get ahead of the game and have a look at some of the case studies we've already got on the fa.com the link is there on the bottom right for you so as i mentioned this is uh webinar number four it is the final webinar of what has been a fantastic series led by russ and some fantastic volunteers from league and club world sharing their stories and experiences all around community engagements the first part looked at that overall community engagement what's the common unity you have um, and making sure that whatever you look, you're looking at and whatever you're uh, working towards is always a two way street. The second part looked at the power of your network. Who have you got internally that can help you? But more importantly, who else is around that may be able to bring different skill sets into your club, league or sporting organisation? Last week, we were joined by Pete from Sir Thomas Finney and Charlotte from the University of Portsmouth, looking at how football um, and clubs and leagues in particular can build and work relationships with educational partners. And then we had um, PC Dave. Oh, sorry, Russ, I forgot his last name. And I'm sure you'll jump in and uh, add that for me. But he gave a great overview of institutions and how different institutions can work with football. And then today we are looking at places, spaces and faces, looking at the wider community and the development of the wider community as a whole. Now, I've mentioned Russ a few times. Um, hopefully you're all familiar with Russ if you've joined us. If not, Russ, I'm going to lead this in nicely to you to um, introduce yourself. <laughs> Fancy forgetting the name of the police officer. PC <laughs> Dave Harnett from Smedic Harnett, police. there we go. There you there go. go. Uh, evening all. As Daniel said, it is a hot one. 
So I do hope you have a beverage of choice. Feel free to share what you've got. If you've got the uh, the uh, the chat box, then by all means, it's okay to share what you've got. I've got a Pepsi Max. That's my choice tonight. It's just come from the fridge. Uh, hopefully you enjoy that. So if you've uh, been on in the previous three, you'll notice my uh, Black Country tones. Uh, I'm Russ Smith. I've worked in community, uh, whether it be for sport development, coaching, um, working in regeneration, a range of roles, really. Uh, and often coaching and sport development comes hand in hand, really. So effectively, my work's predominantly been in the black country uh, through football, whether it be an FA programme, Sport England, uh, some of the work that I've done with clubs, teams. And at the moment, um, a full-time role at university, the University of Wolverhampton. I also am a committee member of the Stairbridge District League. Uh, that's a league of 600 teams in the black country. Um, and I also, when I do have time, uh, I'm a parent of two who also play in that league too. So I've got my first coaching gig back on Friday night, hence why I asked the question, who's been back coaching? Because we have our first session back. Uh, I'm helping out the coach of my son's team. So... Welcome. Hopefully uh, it's not too warm and we will be interactive. So if you do know where your chat function is, just make sure you find that now. I'll be posing you some questions as we go on. And as before, feel free to, to link in and we can make sure we get some interaction from you. We've got some guests tonight. So part of our uh, series about places, spaces and faces, we'll look at where we play football. Uh, so Jack, for an example, will be going through a little bit of the Football Foundation's plans and how they have a tool that might help out with some of the work that we've been going through over the last four weeks. Uh, Michelle's going to be sharing a little bit about where they play football in Essex, so some uh, non-traditional places. And Rayhan on the right, uh, Rayhan's quite an interesting one. He, um, he, well, he worked for me about 10 years ago, but he continues with Restaurant League football. Uh, he works in Faith Centre. And football, for an example, in different populations looks a bit different to our traditional game and format. So how things can be adapted to make sure that we can have, as the FA strapline, for all. Making sure that football can be offered for all those who are in your community. Next slide. So as, as per normal, I'll just give you a little recap uh, of the underlying principles to these webinars, which is looking at community as what's called asset-based community development. And what that is really is looking at how it focuses on the community assets and strengths rather than looking at, you know, individual problems and needs. It also looks at um, skills, passions or those that's in and around you and can mobilise them. So an example, it could be that a different organisation that doesn't work in football might have the skills that you need and hand in hand you can work together so that you win and they win as well. Also, it's community driven, so it's from the inside out. So rather than parachuting things in, it's about looking at where you are and making sure that that can come from the inside out. And it's relationship driven, looking at those networks that you work in and making sure it's long term, longitudinal to make a long lasting change and build a bit of a legacy of the work that you might have on your doorstep. Next slide. And the simple way to think of it is I've always kind of done on all the webinars is make it easy layman's for you. All the Legos mixed up. That's predominantly what community might look like now. But how do you join up the pieces? How do you connect it together and make sure, you know, where you've got those skills, assets, those partners that you might not know about yet, you might be able to join them together to make some beautiful Lego, which I'm sure you can. OK, next slide. And the key is, is looking at it as what's called common unity. So what do you have in common with other organisations, bodies and institutes that you can work together on and create that common unity? That's therefore the common unity that therefore everyone can have a benefit from it. Because ultimately there will be a lot in, an, uh, in a radius of your club or league or depending on where you're based that actually have some very similar shared goals, outcomes that you actually can benefit from, but you can also benefit them. Next slide. So a quick example of um, the ABCD broken down into a bit of a model is here's a club. So this is a club that my daughter plays for called Cuford. If you were to put a uh, ring around um, Kingswinford and Wallheath, where the club's based, 
what would be within the vicinity of that area and we're splitting it into five areas so what are the physical spaces that could be used what's the local economy what's the business like um who are the individuals and what networks already exist what institutions are there so it could be police schools health services etc and what's the halt get me words right what's the heritage and culture like of the area what's the population like to therefore help and aid what we might be able to offer and this is based on a model from McKnight and Kretzmann in 93 which is asset-based community development for those who want to have some further reading which I'm sure we can share with you the key is it's a two-way street don't look at community development as what people can do for you think about what you can do for them and also they for you so hand in hand win-win everybody gets something and that's kind of been the underlying principle so you need to find your chat box next slide first of all please admire the uh, the council based football pitch image i have there for you uh, i'm sure you can spot the problem with that as they wanted to plant some new trees but kind of didn't see where the football pitch was um, you'll need your chat box and my question to start with you is we're looking at the places so the place is really where your club or league play football so in that chat box you might say you might say well we use a schools pitch there's an example all right so i'm going to give you a minute and so where does your club or league utilize places to play football where are they just so i can get a flavor good stadium thank you michelle You're hot off the press today michelle ain't you? Yeah, grass pitches, artificial, club, private grounds, yeah. Thank you, Bill. Some schools, 3G, private, yeah, council pitches. Great, okay. Right, really lucky someone said they got the pitches there. Main facility. 49 year lease well done hayton you've done well with that one hopefully you could build on that too so on what you've put in the chat box then if you go to the next slide i kind of knew that so i've set you up a little bit there because i kind of know where football is played for the majority of the population all right so we kind of deemed by what is in our infrastructure aren't we so at the school's facilities ultimately um it's used in the week by the school we use it on an evening and a weekend and you might have some good community um agreements to do that uh, and sometimes you know it might benefit like we spoke about last week a school club or university or college kind of agreements really which is good uh 3g pitches again you might be really lucky and your club has their own again you might share that as a, uh, a joint facility or it could be on private ground that you use there as well Parks pitches uh, seem to be getting less and less round by me, if I'm being honest. Um, and ultimately, you know, the best pitches kind of get used up four or five times a weekend. But parks pitches, of course, we use those. And private providers, so like goals and places like that. So my question next then, if we go to the next slide. If we think about where we are in England and where you are in England, where could be used as pitches? Because ultimately, there's only a certain amount of council-based facilities. There's only a certain amount of 3Gs. There's only a certain amount of schools that open up their, their gates, really. And some of the images are there to prompt some thought with you. What else is within your infrastructure that could be a pitch? And an example, the picture on the far right is a warehouse. So an example being, there's a lot of brownfield sites, especially around by me in the West Midlands, that ultimately could be transformed into playing and spaces that could be used um rooftops is something that's seen a bit more of a development more on the continent really but multi-story car parks nathan as an example is is a good one um that could be used i like on the bottom left on the ring road underneath the uh, the bypass as an example and by me in wolverhampton they have a skate park underneath one of those but how many of those are in and around the area that has a uh, a junction but with a load of space in the middle of it that might not be used we're black country or us yeah absolutely right luke but that's my point isn't it really so what are those spaces in and around that could
could be different. And if you think about where your club's situated, where else could be had? And this is a question to you now. Is there anywhere where you might have driven past or thought, you know what, that would be good if we could use that place or that space for football or activity? Anything you've come across? A moment that's now good. Okay. Hayton, I'm going to ask you to unmute and add a little bit of value to your comment there, mate. Are you there, Hayton? Can you hear me? I can hear. How are we? Oh, I'm not too bad, thank you. You? Yeah, I'm all good. Share with us a little bit of uh, context about what you've shared there, about a mound that's no good for anyone. So I presume it's a um, an offshoot of maybe a building site or something that's been left to kind of overgrow. Um, History-wise, it's been used as a noise barrier between the leisure centre, the football, the rugby and the housing estate. Yeah. So it's just basically a massive mound. And uh, sometimes it's used for cycling. But okay. other than that, it, it just, you know, it's overgrown. It's left by the council. And if we were to have the funding for it to level it, because the expense is to level it, yeah. um, we will use it as part of our maintenance programme because we've got a, you know, our site, to be honest, you know, we've been working hard on it since 2008 with the... Uh, nine grass pitches, two artificial pitches, and this will help us, um, you know, kind of uh, support with the number of teams we have. We've got 54 at present. So with, so, the, growing, um, with the growing club, there's a yeah. space that could be utilised that's got nothing else to do with it. It's nothing else to do. And not only that, it's also we could open it to more community recreational players, you know, rather than come and kind of you know we don't stop them that our land is not fenced off we mm. need about 70 grand to fence the the least area off so it's all open to the public so if we help the community by building a community ground yeah we will maintain it but it just stops them you know ruining uh, where we have to seed year in year out it, it's just to help each other really Thank you for that share. Uh, I'll you. just pick on quickly on Chris Jackson. Fields all the time. Finding out who owns them is impossible. And I'm going to back that up there because I found that out uh, recently as well with one of the clubs I was helping. Yeah, that is really hard sometimes to find that uh, with some of the fields. Absolutely. And someone else with about fields. Uh, Michelle about a slag heap. Yes, yeah, so have quarries and stuff like that. Uh, church land, that's an interesting one. Errol, tell me about the church land, mate. Yeah, Hi, Errol. Hi, you, Errol. Yeah, tell us about that, pal. Yeah, um, what we have is um, we have, we've got, we own some, we, what we, we own our own ground, but on the entrance to it, we've got a lot of, there's a lot of church land, and which could be developed it's just literally just left there we've, we've got a we had a hundred year lease on this land because uh, it leads up to our ground and it just needs developing that you could actually convert it and put it into make it into a pitch or pitches um there is obviously you know some because it's church land and it's on the green belt we can't put a, we can't put houses on it but we can actually build on it to make it um facilities for outdoor activity or for or for, for sport as it is that's that's what's agreed so you can put a you know like a changing room on it as whatever else but um so that's ideal but it's obviously it needs leveling off but it's the cost of doing it that's the biggest thing so and sometimes yeah. sometimes you find out especially with um faith-based centers or places of worship mm -hmm. that own land it's kind of finding out if there's covenants on it or finding out who actually is owning it or yeah. what can be done as well and that's sometimes mm -hmm. a minefield isn't it yeah, so like I said, we know we know. Like I said, when we've we we've been there for a while now, but we know the church. We pay a peppercorn rent on on this thing, um, but it's just obviously finding, and it's not so much building it; it's having the infrastructure around it to kind of you need to get planning, not plan permission, but you need to get plans drawn up. You need to get so it's a whole, yeah. you know, what I mean, to get there. Our whole mirror. Well, don't worry. Yeah. I'm sure Jack will give you the phone number of the power plater and sort it out, Matt. I'm sure <laughs> I know Jack as well, as well, because he helped That's us good. a couple of times with that. So, yeah. Cool. Thank you, Errol, for that share. Okay, guys, lots of, lots of good stuff there. 
Uh, I've got some more stuff about warehouses being used. Absolutely. I've been to a really good project in Copenhagen called Game. And if anyone has five minutes to Google that, Game is about using brownfield sites or old disused factory units for multi-sport facilities. And it's something that's kind of on the grow, really, especially in Scandinavia. Um, and, you know, if you think about the amount of times you might have driven past these sites, it could be, you know, disused factories or even um, retail outlets that aren't being used now. There is quite a lot of possibility there with the spaces in and around where you might be. All right. Thank you for your interactiveness there. Uh, next slide, please. So my next question then will kind of prompt a bit more thought from you. All right. So we know kind of where you're playing. But I'm presuming most of your football set up for the affiliated formats of the game. So your mini soccer, 9v9s, 11v11s. And sometimes that doesn't really get more people playing. And if you think about um, for all as being the strap line from the FA, is your club for all? And a good example I've used the images here to get you thinking and your thought provoking is, is one of the biggest growing participation, especially for males, has been walking football. They also have something in the Midlands, I don't know if you have it in other parts of the country, called man versus fat, which is basically weight-related football. So you lose more weight, you start with extra goals. Little things like that. It's got more people playing, but more people who weren't playing affiliated football. Uh, an example in the middle, so you'll hear a little bit more soon from uh, Rayhan about late-night football. So an example, there's a large part of the community that actually work shifts or could be restaurant workers, taxi drivers, etc., who really, for them, 6 till 10 p.m. doesn't work or Saturday mornings, Sunday mornings isn't kind of key there. So how could that be something that might align into what your future of football might look like and by who? A couple of you have mentioned fut futsal. Uh, as a league, for an example, we started a futsal league last year for the Stairbridge League. And, you know, we had 60 teams enter and those were predominant youth teams. But all we did was did a partnership with the college. So we were able to get um, a double sports hall for a year long rental period, but make sure that we aligned it in as some of the principles of last week with students to help us to run it. But a massive growth in futsal. Um, playground schools, a good example which I put down there. So schools football, how many kids play football at school compared with those who might then cross over into a club. Uh, I'm not quite sure of the statistics there, but I'm pretty sure that it's a lot lower. So how is that linked to and what development could happen there? Because a good baseline of football in schools can actually then grow those who might join your clubs. Uh, Faith-based centres, uh, that's a picture there. Um, and I think that's from Tiverdale, which is by me. And it's basically using the grounds in and around faith-based centres where football activity might happen and it might be more culturally... Uh, specific, so it may be females only, but it may be certain age groups. But ultimately, the transfer across of communities that might not already be in your club might mean that your club might need to go and work elsewhere just for some outreach work, really, and look at how you could develop some of the uh, football services, teams, activities, clubs in their facilities too. On the right hand side, the final picture is kind of there to to prompt you about those communal spaces, really. And something I mentioned last week, that family football, because you can just go to the park and have a kick around, but are there like communal spaces in and around your club settings or on your clubs where dad, mom, nan, granddad, grandkids, whoever, can just have a kick about? There, there probably is, but is that something that you might need to think about in terms of, you know, offering football for new people or new ways. And a really nice and interesting way to think about this is if I'm in a club setting and I've got two kids, but my kids need to train at a different time, that means I might need to be there for three hours. But actually, if training could be of communal times or link age groups together or link you know, specific areas, could be multi-age, Maybe there's something that could develop and grow from that. And we know, you know, your affiliated game formats won't ensure the two-year age gap or more. But I'm talking about that recreational where actually um, different age groups can play together, you know, as part of a kickabout. 
Next slide. So who is in your club? Have a little think now, but more importantly, who isn't? And does it represent your area where you live? Now, I did a little bit of a check earlier and 12% of uh, the demographic of England is non-white British. So a range of BME backgrounds, traveller, Irish, etc. And if effectively, if we were to say that, and I know this is a real crass way of doing it, but if one of 12 people in your club wasn't of your traditional area, then are you representative of what really your community or your area looks like? And that'll look different to where you are. So an example, um, if, uh, if you're quite a rural club, your geographics and your demographic population will look very different to an urban area. So it's about, you know, who's not there? And is it something that kind of um, stands out, really? Because there are lots of appetite for football. And you know, the images are there just to prompt a little bit. And the top image is from a club in Rugeley, which is in Staffordshire. So Rugeley is kind of semi-rural. And mums bringing kids to football, but actually they just started provision for mums whilst the kids played football. And that then grew and grew, so it became a team. Uh, on the right-hand side, you know, more of the walking football or veterans type activities, which was probably more a health-related outcome to get more over 45s playing. On the left-hand side, uh, girl-specific or faith group-based, which kind of grows that flexible football format rather than affiliating and playing every Sunday with fixtures, as an example. So how could that be flexible? and How can it link to times or periods that can align in football? And one of the things I mentioned as well, the bottom right is about family-related stuff. So multi-age group where actually... Everyone can come and have a kick about, really. And I think it's kind of a key one just to have that thought of what does your club look like and how are you representative? Because there are a lot of people that do want to play, but maybe there's barriers there, barriers that could be the time of day it happens, the place it happens, or even, you know, the, there's other factors that might prevent football playing. And, you know, we're not just talking about the stuff that's counted and on a scoreboard here or affiliated. We might be just be talking about recreational opportunities to grow the game. And as the FA statement there, for all, how does that look for you? All right. Next slide. The formats that you use is key, really. And, you know, I've been quite reflective on the period that we've, we're in now. And I see so many teenagers just playing keep you up games, heads and volleys, um, hit the wall, wally, various stuff, just in and around the spaces, because there's nothing else to do at the minute for them. But does your club have kind of those recreational areas as well that actually could be that stepping stone into playing? Because we all know that the big drop-off age group, 14 plus, but actually football could still be different to still engage them. They don't just have to play 11 aside as and when the preferred formats of the uh, the FA rules. So what recreational options are there? Futsal's a key one. We all know it's dead hard to get indoor facilities. But are there playgrounds? Are there school facilities? Are there rooftops, car parks, for an example, that might be accessible and close to you within your geographic footprint? Uh, I came across a project last year. It wasn't football, it was cricket. And it's car park cricket that's played on an ASDA. And the reason why it works is because as there's flat and there's floodlights, but they're the car park lights. So is that something that therefore could be utilised if there was a relationship or joint opportunity to do so? Football golf, again, a recreational one. Uh, and I, I put that in purposely because the club that my daughter's in has a football golf centre next door to it. But my daughter's been in the club nearly two and a half years and I never know. <laughs> so it's how closely things work together. And sometimes making sure that these things work or communicate and have that win-win is key. And lastly, the, the late night stuff. There's lots of little tripwires with the late night stuff for about, you know, you might have to turn lights off at 10 o'clock with a community agreement. But sometimes, you know, there are spaces that can be used because we're a 24-7 society, really, in some areas and some sectors. 
So how some of your community members might be looking to play football in the non-traditional times is a key one. I'm just going to have a quick look at the chat box because we've had a few bits coming in there. Uh, great wheelchair football, yeah. Disability, I agree. Rural, big problem attracting, keeping coaches, yeah. I think sometimes that's a hard one as well. So maybe it's about what's the offer for them. Uh, Michelle with the uh, urban area, yeah, recreational. On hold, obviously, for COVID at the moment. I understand that. I mean, one example I've, I've banged my head against, really, is as a committee member on the league I'm on, I often <laughs> preach about, you know, is 11 a side suitable for all 14 plus? You now, it is for some, but we lose some. And I've been trying to have small sided um, games, leagues, as an example, which might be quite flexible. Now, Rome wasn't built in a day, and I'm still banging the wall on that. But, you know, sometimes we have our constraints that stop us from developing some new stuff because traditionalists might have their views on it. But I think ultimately, you know, our statistic stats can show people will just play football and how can we utilize that and build upon it is the key one how can we support it how can we win win we help them and they help us in some way shape or form excellent so i'm going to introduce you to rayhan um just a little bit of history before we listen to rayhan uh so rayhan used to run a team called rail west brom um uh, in west bromwich of course and they were in a restaurant league. They also, do, you know, did tournaments with other uh, Bengali predominant communities across uh, the country, but also did late night football. Now, whenever we have a voice note share like this, what I'd say to you guys is turn up your volume on your headphones or on your device. Have a listen up. It's about eight minutes and it's a conversation with Rayan giving you the perspective of What's football's like for those who might have a different working pattern or culture or ethnicity, of predominantly maybe the norm, really? So have a listen up. Uh, I'm not going to take Parkinson's job soon, but have a listen, guys. Hi, I'm here with my friend Ben. Just introduce what's your name? My name's Rayhan Mia. Hi, Rayhan. And we're going to have a little talk about some of the things that uh, football has engaged in different ways. So... Some of the topics I'd like to talk to you about, there's going to be projects that you've done with Restaurant League, um, Ramadan Midnight Football, and also some of the rationales of why flexible football is a great way for cultural difference people playing. Now, just quickly, Ryan, tell me about your involvement in, in football. So, well, I used to play for a Sunday league team where I originally met yourself across and then moved on one day to coaching. From the coaching, uh, we started building our team bigger scale and it was a very multicultural team our team that we just got very best from we landed the team with about 12 which is very easy for us we still participate in local tournaments now and football tournaments but uh, we don't have a regular side team anymore it's just things as you go that you get more commitments so, so you, you guys participate in, in a league so yeah. and i think this league still runs called shackle league yes so, tell me a bit about that yeah, so we participated in the Shaftley League for about three or four years. Um, it was very good quality league in the sense that there was a mixture of so many different ethnicities, but it was predominantly of uh, the AME. Um, so it was quite different as well because we played in other leagues as well where we were probably just like an Asian or a common team. But when we played in the Shaftley League, it was, I think we were more of a majority there. And it was on a Sunday where we all just got together. It was structured, but it wasn't like a Saturday league where we got there in the afternoon and then we got to the so which was, um, it was really good. And then we moved on from there to the Warden League, and we became the first one. So we just wanted to push ourselves. The quality was good, but the league was very small. So we wanted to play more teams, so we moved on. So with Shaffer League, you mentioned about the teams similar to, to yourselves. Yeah. What was the timing of that? So in other words, you know, predominantly for us in England, happens on a Saturday or Sunday morning? Was it a different time? Yeah, yes, it was because a lot of the games used to be played about two o'clock kickoffs on a Sunday or you had it a little later as well. Uh, one of the main reasons was, uh, which we'll go on to later on, is a lot of the lads that were playing were actually restaurant workers and um, a lot of them probably worked the night before like on a 
a Saturday night, you know, about one, two, three in the morning, but so wake up at nine o'clock in the morning to go play is the best of uh, yeah. best of time. So that's why they were actually quite accommodating and then they made the kickoff times a bit later so um yeah, we could come and play. Okay. So changing the time helped to suit those who were working late in the night. And you used to have uh Spoke to yourselves as well at one of the schools that you were working at the home uh, at that time, and we came up with an idea of having football at 12 o'clock in the morning. Now, some people just laughed at us thinking 12 o'clock in the morning, but the reason why we did that was a lot of these lads on a weeknight they would finish work 11 o'clock at night and because the restaurant workers and whatever are half them at night. And for them, that time of the night is actually their relaxing and chilling time. So it's not, you've got like snooker centers that are open today or you've got other things that they can do, but there wasn't any sports centers or anything. So we came up with the idea to be a self force and we said, okay, we'll give it a bit of a try. And we ran that for about a year and a half and we got a lot of numbers. And then we started having interest of other people wanting to do other sports in there as well. But obviously, we just took to football. I think one of the successes that came from that was Bloom and Kenzie and they took the idea and they made a Ramadan midnight league. What do you know about that and the involvement? Yeah, so what happened was with the Ramadan football league, they took that into Birmingham, I think, to initially start it off with. The reason being, I think, Birmingham had a bit more, diverse, not only diversity, but it was um, more accommodating for all the people around there with the black country and Sandal. I don't think it was as much. But um, over the last couple of years, the um, midnight uh, or the Ramadan League, if you want to call it, has become more popular. And even though it's called Ramadan League and it feels like it's for Muslim lads or whatever, when we played in it or participated in it, we've started to see other lads that have come and joined. And it is for everyone, it's not only our, it's only for lads that are fasting during Ramadan. But one of the reasons why it's called the Ramadan League is during Ramadan, as you know, at the moment, the fasting is like maybe 13, 14 hours with no food or drink. So the guys are going with that. And then, to be honest, a lot of, not many people want to play during that time. So what tends to happen is after we break or open our fast, which is after sunset, a lot of the lads go out and kick around for about an hour. And I bet recently, um, Ms. Rama from the Rama County FA has actually contacted us on this as well and is trying to do something in West Brom. I know they haven't done so just try to move it to commentary as well. So uh, the football can happen at the normal time that we know. No, well, definitely it can happen. If you have a football and you do ask someone to play, I'm sure anyone can play at uh, any time. Um, I have still people calling me now saying, oh, why don't you play like football anymore? Um, but we've moved on to different sports and everything. And the access to the place that we were at day one. Day well, that's day. key. So yeah. the facilities, there's not many facilities that go, you know what? We're open at 12. There's not many places yeah. that can host it. I think that's one of the main problems is a lot of people don't have access to some of the facilities. If you did have access to the facilities, I can guarantee you that it would fill up as well. But again, it is sometimes the social hours, but sometimes it works because you've got a lot of these guys that want to still stay fit, that want to stay, um, you know, participate with their friends and stuff. If you've got 24 hour gyms, you can have something like, I'm not saying 24 hour football, but if you had some gym two, three in the morning on a certain day, you definitely would get people going in there and playing, especially guys that, that are working in restaurants. So there are other people that do other late night stuff Taxi. like taxis, but you know, some of them that work in factories, they would definitely come up there. I think it's a, it's a really good point because traditionally most football facilities are set up for those who are playing on it. Saturday morning, Sunday morning, yeah. or train on an evening till nine. But there's a whole population and community that can play outside of those hours, and predominant football venues don't accommodate for that. I definitely agree with that because as a country, we're very well so, uh, and I think things are changing. Um, a lot of the youth generation do stay out till later. Um, if you had a league till twelve one o'clock, they would actually be there. It doesn't have to always be restaurant. All you have to do now is send something out on social media, I guarantee you, you get 
Okay, guys. Oh, you don't you don't hear me again, do you, folks? <laughs> so, so the key, really, that Rayan's message in there is is there's a lo- there's a lot of people that play oh, football. Uh, guys, just reminded to mute, mute your mics if so. We don't know, we're not not too fussy what you're having for your tea, but feel free to share a picture if you need to as well. Uh, just back to the point. So Rayan basically was kind of you know if I summarise it really well, football happens anyway. However, the constraints sometimes that we have from our governing bodies means it's not recognised. Uh, I think someone put that in the chat as well. So, for an example, you know, I could go down the park and there's 20 kids playing football. No one needed to affiliate. No one needed a ref. It just happened. Now, that's a really raw example. But other types of football's happening. So, restaurant league you heard about there, faith centres midnight league so it's sometimes the constraints that stop football growing really and it's hey maybe thinking about that in terms of if you are going to look at developing or growing some of the provisions or some of the people that may come to your club uh, that voice file will be shared uh, so it might have a clearer quality for those who might just missed a few words here or there uh, and that will kind of come in as part of um, Daniel share after, all right. So, thank you for listening to Rayhan. There, let's go to our next slide, and I think we're welcoming uh, Michelle from the Essex Senior League. Are you there? Good evening. How are we? Yeah, hot, sticky. Well, there you go. I'm on my second drink now, second Pepsi Max. So, I'm going to hand over to you to tell us a little bit about the different places that football might happen. Okay, I'll start by introducing Essex Senior League. We're a step five league in the national league system. So we're under lots of FA constraints and rules and regulations, like many of the leagues. But what we decided three years ago is we needed to raise the profile of the league to attract sponsors and spectators, players, partners, because in our area, it's a high density of high level football. So we're competing with the Ismian League, for example, um, in Essex particularly, for sponsorship. Uh, spectators as well. I mean, um, clubs have come through Essex Senior League and stayed up in the higher echelons of, of the National League system and don't tend to come back down. And if you started out in Senior League supporting Canby Island, for example, you would tend to follow them through. So we, over the years, our, sponsor, our spectators have dwindled, as have our sponsors. So we decided to be a bit creative. And what we said was we were going to think outside of the box um, and adopt non-traditional football action so we weren't going to actually look in the football world for sponsorship and and spectators we were going to go to shopping centers where there's a higher traffic footfall 
I think we were told on a Saturday morning, this field had something like 30,000 people go through where we were actually pitched. So we went to the Westfield Shopping Centre in East London, at Stratford, and we devised a, um, a, a questionnaire, if you like, to ask these individuals what they were interested in football, whether it was a player, three coaching, sponsorship, uh, physio, all that sort of thing, to try and get more people into our league. We found that there was a lot of interest and there were a lot of people from the Essex region going to East London to the Trafford Centre. So we were in the right area for our league at the time. And we worked in partnership with Essex County FA to direct them or, or send those people in the right direction. So if you were interested in refereeing, we'll pass them over to the Essex County put them on referee courses, that sort of thing. And the same thing with coaching. Um, even with the players, youth players, we don't run a, a youth league. So we were directing and signposting youth players so that they would be directed to the nearest club to them. What we found from that exercise was that there was a lot of interest in football from boys, girls, young and old and we demonstrated this by having a freestyler he it is a 10 minute demonstration half hour free trial or tricks class with individuals but what they had to do is complete our flyer and sign to give permission for us to contact them but also gdpr is coming in so we made sure that they had to give us all their contact details and say sign a waiver and give permission for us to contact them at a later date so that we could make that, that connection with them and get the data which we're still using now and I believe the county will be still using recently as well. So it gave us a database. From that database we managed to you know direct people. We ended up with a, a volunteer on the league who then went on a coaching course and ended up um, working all over the world in football. And as a result of his connections with the league, he's, he's now developed, he wants to go into education. And he's just signed up for a course, which I've given him a reference for, for the University of Liverpool. So he's, in, he's actually engaged in increasing his employability through his connection and association with the league. So we were looking at things like that. What we actually did with Westfield Centre, we had players come down to do a VIP meet and greet. They were actually talking with members of the public demonstrating was going on and we also engaged with a volunteer Scott Traveller from Scott Traveller's Football Academy who provided some equipment so they can do penalty shootouts and spot the balls and all sorts of you know fake type interaction which was meant that we had a constant flow and waiting list and people gathering around our cage or our environment our pitch environment attracting attention um, I'm trying to think what else we did. That actually raised his profile, but it also raised the profile of what football meant. It doesn't necessarily mean football's just a player, someone kicking a ball around, a committee member, a physio, and that's the message we were portraying. So if you see the red banner, it says like football, and we were given our individuals uh, roles, we were highlighting the different areas within football that you could actually become involved with it isn't necessarily becoming a player or coach and um, give as much or a little time as possible we found that really really useful for the league moving on from that we decided that we were going to have a groundhog weekend We'd never undertaken that before i knew absolutely nothing about it so i contacted ground help uk who gave me a wealth of knowledge and ideally they would have preferred to have run the, the event but we decided we would go alone and, and try ourselves and we had a four match ground pop over a 24-hour period to raise profile of the league and also to um to, to attract spectators to be different we had some people fly in from edinburgh to come to our ground hop because essex senior league had never done a ground hop before and so what we were aiming to do was increase the gate increase, increase the footfall takings for the clubs but we asked them to be different we didn't want to have burgers and chips and hot dogs at every event and one of the clubs did this really really well in undertaking a caribbean barbecue and 
Caribbean music and gave it a festival party atmosphere, which went down really well. And that was the last game of the weekend. It, it sort of left everybody on a high because most of the people that attended that groundhog had never been in that environment before. And you'll see from the slides some of the pictures from that event with freestyler Colin there, the football academy blow up ball thing that we had and some of the food that was prepared by family and friends. So they were just utilising what they had and making money for the for their own clubs. The attendances rose. We were very... See, I think the average attendance was 75 per game, which is extremely unusual for our games. Most of our clubs are lucky to have between 30 and 50 attend their games. There's one or two exceed that, but the majority of them are lucky to have for 30 to 50 and this was two years ago so the attendance increased but on average of 75 per game which increased their revenue no end oh, this sounds this sounds Sorry. like this sounds like i should be going to stratford more to shop rather than the westfield by me because they don't have any football by me i think using these different ways to attract new members and people is Something that's key, isn't it? Because, you know, in the previous webinars, I've, I've put a lot about if we always just do football, we always just get football. And that widening of who we are coming across is a great example of how you've uh, took your football to the community to grow interest, members, opportunities. Um, and I think it's something that really could be showcased. So thank you for that share, Michelle. Great stuff there. I really do. I really do find this some Caribbean barbecue now. Though. That's the only downside. But there you go. Um, thank you for that. And last but not least, to kind of bring this stuff to kind of light a little bit more, uh, here's our icing on the cake is Jack, because all the stuff we're talking about here, really, we can put into action with some of the plans that the Football Foundation have, and they're developing. Uh, we're nearly in readiness, a bit of a toolkit to embrace some of the things we've been speaking about to put into action. Jack, you there? I am, Russ. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Do you fancy some Caribbean barbecue? Fantastic. I've just written down I should be going to Stratford a little bit more as well. A little, <laughs> little, bit, too, a little bit too far south from Leeds, but um, yeah, that sounded, that sounded fantastic. No problems. It's all yours then, my man. Over to you. Brilliant. Thank you. And uh, yeah, good evening, everybody. Um, so as um, as Russ has mentioned, my name's Jack Matthews, um, and I work for the Football Foundation as one of our programme investment managers. Um, and following a couple of conversations that I've had with Russ and Daniel over the last week, I've kindly been given the opportunity to join and just share a little bit of context with them this evening. So um, I think the key point to make from the start, I'm not going to come on here and share any sort of different messaging. Um, if anything, I'm hopefully going to reinforce a lot of what's been spoken about both throughout this evening's webinar, but also the series in general, when we talk about community engagement and the benefits of adopting um, such an approach. Um, and hopefully just put a bit of context to that of how it comes together from a facilities perspective um, from, from the Football Foundation's point of view. Um, so I think community engagement um, is something that we and our funding partners um, re really fully believe in, I guess, as an approach that can support the, the growth and the development of the game, a lot of what's been, been spoken about already this evening. Um, and I think for those of you very quickly that, that, that don't know or haven't had any dealings with the Foundation in the past, um, we are essentially the Premier League, the FA and, and government by a Sport England um, football foundation. So we are the charity that through grant aid helps communities to, to, to improve local football facilities. Um, and as a charity, we've been in existence since the year 2000. So celebrating our, our 20th anniversary this year. Um, and in that time, invested in more than 16,000 grassroots projects across England. I'm not going to come on here and make that sound all absolutely rosy and it's job done. I've seen a few of the messages that are firing around in the, in the chat function around people's, people's challenges and frustrations when it comes to football facilities. And we are absolutely accepting that there is a heck of a lot more work that still needs to be done. But hopefully I can set a little bit of context today around how, how some of that can be. Um, can be moved forward. Um, so I think as the statement says on screen, um, we invest in local facilities to help to transform lives and, and strengthen communities. So it's not a case of investing for investing sake. Um, we invest with the, with the tact and the know-how of working in partnership with the respective applicant 
um, that given facility is going to make a real difference in the community. Um, and we work alongside applicants to ensure that investment that we put into facilities will support in delivering some of the key outcomes um, that we want to see. And again, I'll, I'll come on to mention those shortly. Um, the, the scale of that investment over the years, and, and as I said, just to give a little bit more context, so uh, and, and still remains the same today. That investment is everything from fairly small scale levels to help fix broken boilers in clubhouses or, or get pitches ready for the new season. And hopefully some of you will have seen the, the recent pitch preparation fund that we've, um, that we've launched only earlier this month, um, all the way up to the, the opposite end of the spectrum with, um, with multi-pitch hub sites uh, and a different range of facilities. So I suppose that's just the, the, the spectrum to share with you. Um, can you jump on to us, please, Daniel? Thank you. So when it comes to those large scale capital investments, um, we target where that investment is most, need, most needed via local football facility plans. Um, so this is a process that's been led by the FA, supported by the County FA network, um, started back in 2018. And we are nearing completion now where every local authority area in the country will have a completed local football facility plan. I think that's roughly 325, I think it is, up and down, up and down the country. Um, and those plans focus on four different facility types, which are listed out there on screen. Um, and again, will hopefully ring true with, um, with some of the images that Russ showed earlier on screen around where people play the football at the moment. Um, and through investing in these facility types, um, the aim is to be able to service different formats of the game and demographics. So that's both the traditional affiliated game, but also looking to ensure we can cater for the more recreation, recreational and informal markets and, and, and everything in between. So that's that's essentially um, again echoing some of what's been spoken about um, what's been spoken about earlier. Um, I think the the I suppose the key point when we talk about the actual audience that we want to reach through through some of this investment, um, it's about trying to service both the existing audience that are playing the game already, but again, linking back to previous examples, looking at new and in, in, innovative ways to get people either back playing the game again or engaged and, and participating for the first time. I think the, the example um, and the voice note that was shared previously um, made reference to um, being, being connected to the Yenemi Yemeni Faith Centre um, within the West Country area. So again, just to give a bit of context around the local football facility plan for, for that given area, that is, a, that is a project that's been identified throughout the, the, the small-sided facilities aspect. And again, has been identified as a way of trying to create a, a facility type and an offer to suit that particular audience. So as I say, just trying to bring, bring all this together a little bit um, to, to echo some of the earlier messages. Um, and I think to support with this and to, to, to re-emphasize what I said at the start, we really want to ensure that community engagement is something that is, that is ultimately fully embedded within our application processes. So if you can just jump onto the last slide, Danielle, I'll just set a little bit of context. Um, so this is something that we, we fully believe in as, as, as being an absolute tool, if you like, to, to really start to encourage that outside of the box, outside of the box thinking, encouraging people to, to think broader and wider around how they do start to engage with the community. But acknowledging again and holding our hands up that this is something that's new for us. It's a tactic that we haven't traditionally um, sort of in, embraced and embedded within the processes, but something that we're really encouraging our networks to think about. Um, as we've seen examples across sort of the sports sector where this is where this has worked really well. So as Russ mentioned at the start, we've been we've been working on a on a tool to support this. So we've developed what we're calling the community engagement toolkit. Um, and this this was shared with me only earlier today. I've just noticed that the man in the um, in the grey top doesn't appear to look like he's got any shorts on. So we've got a little. Luckily, that's not been for, uh, shared further and wider at the moment. We, we've got a little bit of work to do with our designers to. Um, to, to tidy that up, but um, this toolkit is something that we're, we're, we're testing at the moment with a select number of projects prior to uh, the, the, the wider rollout and availability of, of that document. Um, the, the application guidance that, that we share with applicants makes it very clear that community engagement is, is the first step on the journey um, and a really important part of potential applicants that will come forward for future Football Foundation investment. Um, but I think that the, the premise and a lot of the messaging that we're trying to give is absolutely still still rings true with operators of, of existing facilities or, or simply providers of activities, whether that be clubs or community groups that want to 
diversify their offer or, or, or try to engage with a particular uh, with a particular group of people. Um, and I think just some of the key points um, that are listed out there on screen to, to mention. Um, I think again, as, as, as Russ has mentioned within previous um, webinars, linking back to the, the asset-based community development um, concept, I think what we're trying to set out within the toolkit is, isn't rocket science. Um, we're trying to emphasise that it's down to making connections and, and having conversations um, with individuals within the community and engaging with those that, that can effectively engage with them. Um, and I think it's about, as, as we say on screen there, it's about developing projects with the community, so not making assumptions or having preconceived ideas about what people may want as their, as their football fix, if you like. Um, and going back to, again, previous comments, that, that two-way process of how can we, um, how can we find mutual, mutual benefits, if you like, of working, um, working cross sectors. Um, so again, it's thinking broadly and diversely when identifying partners that could be engaged with on a local level, um, and then looking at those organisations that, that really make a difference um, to people's lives and encourage them to find to find that common ground. And again, just to share some of the examples um, from from the, uh, the the first webinar where the Solihull Moors case study was shared and their relationship that they've managed to develop with the likes of the NHS and the local food bank. Um, and again, as weapons last week, relationships with, with the police can hopefully start to engage with, with, with new audiences and organisations that have got that, um, that got that real reach that I think in, um, in some areas the, the, the more traditional football groups wouldn't necessarily have. Um, so that's, that's a whistle stop tour from me and, and hopefully give a bit of context to how, um, how what's been spoken about over the duration of these series comes together um, for those that are either existing facility operators or will be looking to to apply for future foundation investment either as an operator of a facility or being connected into a, a future facility project as a um, as a partner or a user group so, thanks jack thank thanks you for that appreciate it so it's really good to hear folks that you know an awarding body of grants are building community in as part of their application processes because sometimes you know that's a really undersight that's missed so the football sometimes win but actually there's often other areas that could have won and the bit i've put on this slide is some of the partners here that can really help you develop with your population uh, and some of the areas where you might not have insight but they do so if you look on the left hand side of the screen um sport england funded or kind of overarching bodies for Insight on working with different community groups is Sporting Equals. They have quite um, quite a good website, really, of some of best practice through sport um, of aligning in different communities that you might not have engaged with before traditionally. Underneath that, working in areas of deprivation with young people. Uh, street Games also kind of take the sector lead on that as well. So, you know, it's looking at those... Uh, areas that might be linked to crime, so you can use it to crime prevention, uh, health inequalities, but predominantly that under 25s group. At the bottom, I've mentioned it many weeks, is Active Partnerships. They will have a whole insight team, and I'm telling you now, they should be able to tell you how many people, what age, what demograph, how much they earn, and whatever within a population sector that you might be based in. You really utilise their services because they're there for you. And football really doesn't utilise active partnerships really well. We tend to go to our county FA, and that's fine. But the active partnerships will have lots of insight and demographic that you can use to help you make informed decisions. Voluntary sector councils, I've mentioned um, two or three weeks, you know, looking at what skill sets and what assets they will have to help you, especially here as it might be about increasing your workforce because a lot of your chat was about workforce as well, and some of your points are valid, uh, and again, with health as well. And I think to summarise those four things is we're going to be entering a period that's really interesting. We've never been in this period before. Post-COVID, there's money now because there's investment from government, from um, charitable sector, etc. but that's probably going to dry up after. So how we work in partnership with these organisations and bodies now is crucial because that can really help your club with its plans or your league, with how you sustain and what your legacies are. 
And ultimately, building those links there will really help, really help to kind of develop some more of what you might want. And I noticed someone put in the chat about what they do in Iceland. Well, I've been to Sweden quite a lot, and the kind of multi-function um, one site suits all per town, per village, etc., is great practice. But ultimately, it's paid for differently. And I think, you know, how many times have we sat in a room with the hockey club, the cricket club, the health service, the doctors? It's really rare that we get together and try and solve the same problem, isn't it? We tend to be competing all for the same people, for the same thing. So that working together here will really help us develop uh, in the future. Next slide. And I've put together some links for you, which will again be shareable from Danielle, to help you out with a couple of bits that we spoke about tonight. So um, the FA compiler football and faith calendar really, just to help you out with some of those things like we've mentioned tonight about Ramadan football or looking at when some of the festivals are, because that could be utilised by yourself to, to grow the game or make themes with some of the offers that you're having. Or even like Michelle did with the league, you know, utilise different areas that's not football to kind of grow participation or workforce development. Um, football Foundation local plans, those are accessible, I think, Jack, just through the Football Foundation website. Uh, you tend to put in your, your local authority area and you tend to get the one you want. Is that right, Jack? It is exactly that, Russ. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll share the link so that it can be included within the um, that presentation. Thank you. Uh, Sporting Equals, as I said before, about the insights, about working with different community um, groups, street games with the areas of deprivation and active partnerships, all about finding out that insight. So I would like you to now just have a little think about what questions could you ask me, Jack or Michelle, based around some of the things you've heard tonight. If it's a specific about your club and funding, just park that one because that can then link back in with follow up with the Football Foundation. So it might be a generic thing that might help out from the themes about who's the population, uh, what spaces could be used, some of the things that might prompt. And remember, our webinars have covered these areas that's on your screen now. So I don't mind if you want to recap on someone, any of your questions that might link to me, all right? So have a quick think. Just drop your questions in the chat box and we'll pick them up uh, and try and answer them as best as we can before the night is out, if that's okay. So one, let me go back through a couple of them. Jack, I'm going to ask you a question, if you don't mind. Of course. Um, quick question. So, how easy is it to get the partners around the table? So, you know how we said about multifaceted facilities. So, for an example, do you work with the other sports as well? You know, because some of the clubs or some of the leagues might have those shared facilities, such as hockey or with rugby, etc. Is that something that happens? It is, yeah. So I think I'd have to answer it twofold, Russ. So it's um, we facilitated by Sport England the all of the pitch sports um, are, are, are gathered together on a on a regular basis. So pitch sports being ourselves, um, rugby football union, rugby football league, England hockey, um, and the England and Wales cricket board. So those are brought together primarily to. Um, to strategically plan, I guess, is the best way of putting it. So to, to support with production of, of playing pitch strategies, but also identifying where, where one another's particular priorities lie and then understanding within a given area if there are mutual opportunities to, to consider um, investments or, or, um, or, or utilisation of, of one another's facilities, I suppose. So I think that's probably on a more strategic planning level. I think when it gets down to particular investment in, in said sites, then again, it would all come down to the, the given project's aspirations, if you like. But there is that network on a on a local level whereby we, we do have regular dialogue as, as governing bodies. So, um, so, so yes, on both fronts, I suppose. I think one of the things I've seen for that through rugby in the area I live, there's been maybe five new 3G pitches for rugby, but they're also multi-purpose for football as well. So goals come on, etc. Uh, where maybe that was kind of a, 
a, a strategic plan from the RFU investments to have that multiple usage as well. So thank you for that, Jack. Right, let's have a look. Yep. Questions. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to answer the questions coming from uh, Jeremy and Ruth Reynolds. So our guest opinions, where do we think football at our levels as we emerge from the pandemic Will it be a harder sell with the community or the potential more mutual opportunities? Okay, so good question. I think personally that football has that easy sell because it's our national game. But what I do think is sometimes the constraints stop people going from having a kickabout in the park to maybe joining a club. So, you know, the rules, the regs, the admin that's put in the way for that as well. And ultimately, post-COVID, we're going to be a bit more COVID secure and mitigating, aren't we? So, for an example, you know, now you might have examples where you might spray the balls with um, disinfectants or you might have to give certain sort of details or you can't do specifics on the mounts. Now, there's going to be some more rules and regs that come in that might prevent people playing. So it's a really good thought. I mean, obviously, we don't have a magic wand and we don't know. But the one thing I do know that there's lots of young people, older people, adults that predominantly have missed football and getting back out to doing some sort of activity, whether it be through, you know, with their friends or on a park or at their club or whatever it might be, is a positive thing. I think we've also missed as well... um, the Euros or the big summer tournament that, you know, tends to get people playing a lot more. The good news really is, is that's coming next year, hopefully. (laughs) Fingers crossed. And that kind of raises the profile, especially as we've missed out on the female competition, which had great growth last year. And obviously with the Euros that would have been happening this year. So hopefully that answers your question. I mean, obviously I don't have a magic wand, but I wish I did. Um... Let's go then. So, Lyndon. Jack, do you want to answer Lyndon's? Um, Will the FA continue to support 3G services post-COVID-19 as they appear not to be hygienic as traditional grass? That's an interesting one. So maybe, not about the FA's spin on it, but maybe has there been any talk that you've had at the Football Foundation about um, the surfaces of 3G and COVID? Um, I I'll caveat what I'm about to say with I am not the technical expert within the organisation, so please don't take this as, as, as gospel by any stretch. Um, aware of, um, yeah, kind of aware, aware of what's, what's been said there. From, from our perspective, I guess as a straight answer, it's, it, it's no, as, as we've identified through local football facility plans, um, we want to continue to invest in 3G artificial grass pitch provision, um, as well as improve natural, natural turf. I think what what we all know from artificial pitches is, is they are ever evolving. So if we go back to 10, 15 years when we had sand dressed AstroTurf pitches um, and a lot of football was played on those facilities, um, we, we've seen that evolve and, and develop to the, to the facilities that we've got in front of us now. I think accepting the point around some of the some of the challenges around around maintenance, upkeep, cost, that sort of stuff. I think the, the market of of 3G carpets is a, is an ever evolving one. So I think will we start to see potential um, improvements and enhancements to facility types in future? Absolutely. Um, whether that's directly connected into COVID um, or, or, or not, I, I really wouldn't like to comment. But I think it is an ever-evolving market that's that's always looking at ways to um, ways to, 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 to improve ultimately. I don't think anyone would have been in the court of law and said Jack said. So thank you, Jack, for giving us your. <laughs> Your best answer there, if that's okay. Uh, I've scrolled up a little bit and I found one from Kieran, uh, which is about housing. Um, So, Kieran, one of the things I mentioned, uh, I think it was on the second webinar, was about something where if uh, house builders are building new properties and new houses, there is a law called Section 106 where they have to put back into uh, recreational or leisure facilities. It's not easy but it's your council that would lead on these things. So if you're in an area where there's lots of house building going on, have a chat with your council about what they're doing with some of the Section 106 spend, which might be able to align in some of the uh, facilities that might come uh, through that provisions, okay? 
Um, and I'll just scroll down. Yeah, Derek was mentioning about um, contact and getting more details. Michelle's put stuff about. That's a good one, Michelle. Would you like just like to share that about working in non-football spaces about insurance? Because that's quite a good a good point you've made there. Yes, working with Westfield, they were very demanding in they have to have for anybody to come on site. So we had to join the contractors list. We had to provide 10 million public liability. We had to have a risk assessment. We had to provide sizes of tables, um, advertising material. I mean, it is quite concise. They are very, you know, multi-billion billion organization. They are very, very concise and aware of their legal obligations, in which case they make us do the same. And mm. that took us six months. It wasn't an easy job to complete, but once you're on there, you're on there for the period of your insurance, and then you have to keep submitting updated insurances. Um, and regularly, when they do their, what they do is a cycle of community events. I'm pretty sure a lot of um, larger shopping centres do the same. So last year we didn't do it because they were, they were going on science and arts. The year before, sports in the community. Um, I don't know what they would have planned this year, but what we do is a rolling uh, targeted audience and we met that criteria in providing sports, but providing it in a different way, which, you know, engaged. The same day we were there, they had another sports uh, football organisation and they just didn't have the attraction. There was no one there at their event that we had people queuing up and waiting to take part because we had a participation thing. But that's what worked for us. We also provided goodie bags, so we had a lot of children signing up. Um, we used the goodie bag, which is similar to a party bag. We've got a load of bump in it, rubbish and, and you know, stickers and football memorabilia, football bits and pieces and football rubbers, that sort of thing. We give it away. Everybody loves something for nothing. It doesn't cost us a huge amount of money. We also managed to get Westfield to give us £500 towards the cost of running the event. Um, the yeah. big the biggest outlay was having a freestyler. He was charging us £100 an hour. So although we had him for two days, we managed to talk him into £900, which he, you know, we fitted him in. But that. So we spent 2000 on the event and got £500 back. But the data was much more valuable to us because we wanted to, we want people in the system, we want people coming back into football and enjoying football. I came back um, to where I live in Harlow and a few months later, somebody came up to me and said, you were at Westfield, weren't you? We had a really good day. And now, hmm. it was just a free event. We were exhausted. We spent 28 hours at Westfield that weekend. But it was rewarding because we wanted to have a good day. We had a lot of volunteers. We had players come down wearing their kit and everything. It, it just gave a really good atmosphere and feel. And that's what we wanted to leave, a positive view of Essex Senior League. That's much more important to us than and sponsorship funding we can we can be creative with um but getting that positive message out so that they come to a 16 league and enjoy our clubs that's where we feel that we need to bring people back into the game locally so what you're sharing really is it was short-term pain but long-term gain and something yes. that we spoke about a couple of weeks ago was about the skills and networks that might be better than volunteers or people that might know about the risk assessments or people that might have that underwriting skills with the insurance that actually are in your community where your clubs and leagues are based but are they involved can they help you and take away some of that compliance work that makes it really hard for you and we all know that compliance kills it sometimes doesn't it we want to do lots of more things, but the red tape or the forms to fill in or speak to one person, they don't speak to the other people. It's really frustrating at times. But using that network, finding out who, what, where, why can really benefit and make that win-win. Um, I think, Danielle, that's a really good time for us to kind of move on just to summarise uh, and finish up the webinars, if that's OK. And... For me, really, you know, if you've been on all four, well done. Danielle's going to send you a sticker. Thank you for giving up four Wednesday nights 
Um, hopefully you've gained a little idea or something where you've gone, do you know what, maybe we could do that. Or you've got something where you've started to build communication with organisations, groups, et cetera, et cetera, to, to develop your community work, really, because it is a massive part of what post-COVID is going to look like. How you're working with those partners is key. And look outside of football. The image there is football, add football, get your football. And we all probably have in our clubs and leagues and teams a volunteer that goes, I ain't got time. And that's fine. Not a problem because those people are really valuable at what they're doing. But there are organisations, institutes out there that are doing the same thing as you. They might not be doing it through football, but you might be able to help them as a vehicle to help reach their aims as well. But it's mapping what's there. Look at those five areas that we've you know, gone across and look at what the institutes, the networks, the places, uh, look at what business is like. There are key things already there that can help you. Next slide. And we've had some questions. And I really thank you for having me. And you know what? If, if I've not done any more than you kind of like the Black Country accent a bit more, I'm happy with that. But if not, thank you very much. Danielle will share my details um, if you do want to ask some more questions and follow up from from the conversations we've had over the four weeks danielle back to you brilliant thanks ross thanks michelle thanks jack um again another exceptionally insightful webinar i always take at least two or three things away from me so i'm always learning as well and and rush you, you're spot on there if, if football does football we are only going to get football but I think the most important thing is that these things do take time. Um, I think we've heard it from all of our, our guests over the past four weeks. I know Charlotte from the Portsmouth of Uni was talking about 10, 15 years to get where they've got to in terms of community engagement. Michelle today spoke even around a, a small pod project, but an element taking up to six months just to get the right things in place, that these things do take time. But I think what's been apparent in these last three months is that football does and can connect with its community so it's working off the back of that so yeah again massive thanks for us you've been a, an absolute star these last uh, four weeks and uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to vary up the uh, the guest speakers over the four hmm. weeks <laughs> guys it just leaves me to say um thank you very much for your attendance I'm not sure on stickers. Um, Russ has promised stickers and T-shirts these past four weeks. But uh, like I say, thank you very much for your time. I know it is another evening. I know it's a very hot evening. But you are, have all shown some type of appetite to, to make good headway. Um, and you, you've definitely started that journey. So please do keep it up. My email address I'll share as well. Or you can email me through the Cubs programme at the FA.com. Like Russ said, I'll share his email address as well. There's obviously multiple resources we spoke about right at the beginning of the webinar. Um, we are going to have a break next Wednesday um, and throughout the, the month of July. We're not going to have this scheduled time, but we are going to release a series of podcasts, something a little bit different, something for us to test our, uh, put our, test our toes in the water as such. And we are going to look around money management. So more details will follow. Um, and so a bit more of a heavy topic, maybe not as uh, not as nice and bubbly as community engagement and marketing and communication, but nevertheless, just as an important topic as all the others we've had today. But like I said, that leads me to say thank you very much again for your attendance this evening. Thank you as well if you attended all four. Um, enjoy the rest of your week. I hope it stays sunny for you all at the weekend. Um, and more importantly, take care and stay safe. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, folks. Enjoy. Danielle, thank you very much for being the uh, skills behind the keyboard. And Michelle and Jack, thank you also for your time. Thanks, Ross. No problems. Enjoy. Speak soon. Yeah, bye.